It's July 12th, 2024, and this is the Room Now podcast. Hi, I'm Dr. Jack Cush, executive editor of RoomNow.com. This is our return from the holiday uh, vacation, and uh, we've got a lot of interesting articles that we put up this week. Some of I, these have got to be of interest to you. I'm going to start off with some negative studies. Um, I don't know if you've seen the research, but there's always been this research about uh, zolandronic acid, um, you know, reclass being um, having some efficacy or some utility in the treatment of osteoarthritis. Well, there was an IV um, zolandronic acid study in 222 NeoA patients who had symptomatic NeoA but were not bone on bone, stage four Kelgren Lawrence um, joint space narrowing. And it showed after seven years of follow up, um, those who had the zolandronic acid um, therapy uh, had more requirements for total knee replacements than those that got placebo. So the hazard ratio was a negative 4.5 fold higher odds or, or it says hazard ratio 4.2. Anyway, that's what it says. Point is that you get that it didn't work. In fact, it failed quite quite uh, miserably. Um, colchicine also now a big drug in the cardiology field. I saw this study I thought you might want to know about. It's a, not really a rheumatology study, but it's called a CHANCE-3 study, a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial of 8,000 adults over the age of 40 who have either mild to moderate symptoms of a stroke uh, or a TIA, and they have ele- elevated high-sensitivity CRPs greater than 2 milligrams per liter. And they showed that half the 4,000 or so people who got colchicine 0.5 BID for a few days and then once a day for 90 days had no um, protection against subsequent strokes in 90 days. So when you look at the two groups, the subsequent stroke rate was 6.3% versus 6.5%. No significant difference, a negative study. Speaking of negative studies, the ones that really have bothered me in recent years were those studies that look like they might work regarding vagal nerve stimulation uh, as a preventative non-pharmacologic intervention in rheumatoid arthritis that basically uh, vagal nerve stimulation would decrease TNF levels. It would be like a, using a TNF inhibitor. The original studies um, uncontrolled by Mark Genovese looked really exciting, but then the subsequent studies didn't look so good. And then the auricular stimulation one, ones that were supposed to sort of m- simulate vagal nerve stimulation, those failed. So here's another one. It's a preliminary study. It's called the Reset RA study. Um, And these are preliminary results. So I don't have details. But they said their primary endpoint, and this was an actual implanted vagal nerve stimulator. It's usually done intermittently, not continuously. They read out an ACR20 response rate in RA patients who um, had not responded to usual therapy like methotrexate, 242 patients. 12-week 12 12 endpoint and significant re- results suggesting that that vagal nerve stimulation would be beneficial. But again, we don't have the uh, results on this two-stage, multi-center, randomized, sham-controlled, double-blind, uh, pivotal trial. So you'll be looking for that. Maybe that'll get, that'll get presented at ACR. It wasn't presented at ULAR. Uh, we don't report enough about fibromyalgia here, and I found this um, large registry analysis of... 1,800 plus PSA patients from the the old Corona registry, now called Core Evitas, um, and they found amongst these 1,823 PSA patients that 11% met criteria for fibromyalgia. Moreover, 20.6 or 21% had evidence of widespread pain. Both of these significantly impair our ability to adequately assess these patients or to successfully treat them. Fibromyalgia in this subset, or in that subset, fibromyalgia subset of patients with PSA were more likely to be female, have depression and anxiety, have impaired function, higher BMIs, meaning obesity, comorbidities. Um, it was correlated with CDAPSA scores, patient pain, and tender joint count. So, again, you must be aware that secondary fibromyalgia and, core evit- core and, and, and uh, widespread pain can affect our patients with inflammatory arthritis. Bimikizumab, a drug that's being developed for psoriasis, actually approved for psoriasis, being developed for psoriatic arthritis and axial spondyloarthritis, was studied in two large phase three trials, the mobile one and mobile two studies, 
And we've reported on this from last ACR, but maybe you missed it. Bimikizumab, the dual IL-17 uh, A and F inhibitor, was shown to uh, prevent the onset of uveitis in those two, two studies. So these are AXPA patients given either uh, placebo or bimikizumab and showed it worked on AXPA endpoints. But the patients couldn't enter the trial if they had active uveitis. They might have had a past history, but few did. As far as new episodes of uveitis, it was like 0.6% in the bimikizumab group and four, almost 5% in the placebo group, and this was highly significant. In the small subset who had a history of uveitis, again, they had a significantly lower rate of developing uveitis if they were on the bimikizumab IL-17 dual inhibitor. 6.2 events per 100 patient years for bimikizumab versus 70 if they were on placebo. Looks like you can add that to your list of drugs that will prevent uveitis. I don't know if you've had this head scratcher that I've had about paradoxical drug reactions. We've seen, you know, paradoxical reactions with TNF inhibitors causing psoriasis and causing IBD. Well, we have paradoxical psoriasis being reported with IL-17 inhibitors. So this is a literature review. They identified 35 patients. Almost all of them were SPA patients. They either presented, as far as their psoriasis, either as palmopustular, uh, palmoplantar, uh, pustular psoriasis or plaque psoriasis. But again, the pommel plantar psoriasis is what you see with the TNF inhibitors causing psoriasis as well. Anyway, this occurred a median after uh, uh, of 11 weeks after they started the IL-17 inhibitor. One a third of them continued the IL-17 inhibitor and got better. Two thirds, they had to stop the IL-17 inhibitor and switch to an, uh, another drug effective, another biologic effective for psoriasis, and they got better. So it's a little bit of a selective reporting. Everybody got better, whether they got better by stopping or not. Again, the data on TNF inhibitor-associated paradoxal psoriasis is about 1 in 1,000 cases, most of them being, again, that pommel plantar variant, which is very difficult to treat. And the treatment is you got to stop the TNF inhibitor. Here, is it going to be the same with IL-17? I don't know. We need more reports like this. Um, some of you have asked questions about, do you only do rheumatoid factor and CCP testing? Do you do IgA rheumatoid factor and IgG this and, and these other s smaller um, selective analyses of, of uh, autoantibodies that may appear early before the onset of disease? Anyway, this is an early arthritis clinic uh, analysis. Actually, patients entering the T-REACH trial, which was an early arthritis study, showed that um, IgA ACPA was present in 23% of those patients, which was significantly less than, I think it was 70% for the IgG ACPA, but it overlapped with IgG ACPA um, in 94% of the cases. In, these, in this population, 90% of patients were IgM rheumatoid factor, positive. The point being doing IgA antibodies didn't matter at all in the assessment of these early arthritis patients, had no predictive value. I take that as a teaching point. Um, I found another interesting study on difficult to treat RA patients. This is from Tom Taguchi's uh, group in Japan, I believe. Five-year results, 150 difficult to treat RA patients. They saw, and they don't give me the incidence of D2TRA, it's generally about 10%, maybe a as high as 15% in some studies. Anyway, in their study of the 150 patients they followed, 45% of them of the difficult RA definition resolved, meaning they ultimately responded, but 50% persisted and 5% died. The resolved difficult to treat RA patients were younger, had more treatment changes, more IL-6 use, um, suggesting that maybe you should be treating them with newer drugs, especially if they're younger. Um, uh, now, again, is the IL-6 use going to be selective here? It tends to be used secondarily or, or as third line in Japan, so I don't know how it's going to pan out with the rest of the world. We need to wait and see. Mortality was in, in, in this cohort of 150 difficult to treat patients, and I said it was 5%, was predicted by comorbidity steroid escalation, okay? And there the odds ratios was uh, comorbidities 3.5 uh, holder, 3.5 fold higher risk with comorbidities that were high, like three or more. Uh, and steroid escalation had a 32-fold higher risk of mortality. Not good. 
Um, Takiyasu's arteritis are sort of wrapping up now. Um, if you give them biologics, will it matter? Will it help? In this cohort analysis of 75 patients with Takayasu's, 40 were treated with conventional DMARDs, methotrexate, leflunomide, that kind of thing, azathioprine. 35 were given biologics, um, and they showed that, um, that overall a reduced um, thickness, artery thickness was seen in 73% of their patients. 31% decrease their arterial wall thickness by more than 25%. And in the end, it was either the use of a biologic or other immunosuppressors like azathioprine that were able to reduce arterial wall thickness when they compared the results to those who just got conventional DMARDs. Makes a case for using biologics, and most of the biologics used here were TNF inhibitors. Um, lastly, there's a study about um, um, pollution and the risk of, lu uh, of lupus. I got two studies on the risk of lupus. And one is that the study from the UK Biobank, almost a half million people, um, and they actually did collect data on exposure to nitrous oxide and other kinds of pollutants. They showed that in the 399 patients who had lupus, um, they found a um, 18 to 27 percent increased risk of lupus when they were exposed to these environmental pollutants. And it was even higher in lupus patients who had a genetic risk. I don't know what that's going to be. They didn't actually detail that in their report. But there's, you know, we reported like three months ago about um, polycyclic ar aromatic hydrocarbons also increasing the risk of lupus in the general population. And there's another report on room now from yesterday about the pathogenesis of lupus. And it talks uh, uh, again about uh, environmental pollutants being important in the generation of um, the chemokine CXCL13, which, draw along, which drives um, T cells um, to, dry, uh, to, to make more follicular helper T cells that will drive B cell activity, again, related to um, pollution. This, the other report comes from the nurse's health study. This is from Karen Kostenbatter's group. And in this study, they, lupus wasn't all that common. So, co uh, common. so amongst the nurse's health study, 200,000 nurses in two different um, iterations of the nurse's health study, they had like 4.5 million years of observation, but only 212 cases of new lupus, right? These women tend to be a little bit older, I think, but nonetheless, that when they looked at their diets they, and they looked at the top turtile who were taking ultra processed food, a Western diet, you know, Big Macs, French fries, donuts, these had a, an adjusted hazard ratio of 1.56, meaning 56% higher risk of developing new onset incident lupus compared to those in the lowest turtile. So this is also soft drinks um, and sugar sweetened products. Uh, so the idea is that, you know, there's this picture of, of autoimmune disease now that has the environment as a strong predictor of risk. And it may be that in with certain genotypes that the risk gets even higher. And now you produce the autoimmune state, which is the preclinical state, which may evolve with a few other triggers into clinically manifest disease. I think this kind of research is really framing our thinking, uh, or maybe not just, maybe confirming the way our thinking has been framed in the last few, several years about how you get autoimmune disease. And the last report is on the cost effectiveness of biosimilars versus leflunamide. This is a Korean database that looked at, I think it was uh, 26,000 uh, patients and using Markov modeling, which is what, how you assess um, the cost efficacy of a drug and whatnot. Uh, and here they looked at the lifetime costs of RA uh, and the quality adjusted life years. They compared getting starting with leflunamide to starting with the, bio, the infliximab biosimilar CTP13, that's like inflector and renflexus, or the adalimumab biosimilar um, ABP501. And the cost, lifetime cost of the disease was 
154,000 with leflunamide, 152,000 with biosimilar infliximab, 150, 45,000 with biosimilar adalimumab. And the quality adjusted life years are all exactly the same. The point being that after, you, after methotrexate, should you play around with conventional DMARDs or now with the cost of biosimilars becoming reasonable, can we go right to biosimilars? This is going to challenge maybe how we treat our patients in the future. Again, the great promise of biosimilars is going to be much cheaper, making it more widely available and more patients being more aggressively treated. But, you know, in the United States, we've been very slow on the uptake of biosimilars. I think this data is going to help us make up our mind. That's it for this week on the podcast. Make sure you go to the website to check out these citations and more. We'll talk to you next week. Take good care of yourself.